there is no English authority on this question, and indeed we have been referred to none from any common law jurisdiction. In an earlier hearing of that case, Justice Scott Baker had been, quote, of the view that software probably is goods within the Act. Programs are, as has been pointed out, of necessity contained in some physical medium, otherwise they are useless. It is not simply abstract information, like information passed by word of mouth. Entering software alters the contents of the hardware. However, in the Court of Appeal, a distinction was made between the program, which was seen as an intangible, and the disk with the program, which was seen as the tangible, and it was the disk with the program that was seen as goods. Now, not all commentators see software as an intangible. It has magnetic patterns. It has electronic impulses. With respect to the patentability of computer programs, Philip Leith points out, that in software-related inventions, the physicality of the invention was central to the success of the early UK applications. A physical machine had to be somewhere at the heart of the patented invention. The emphasis on physicality was, in his view, attempting to fit the new technology of software into an already existing mental conception, and the best-fitting conception was that of machine. So let's first have a look at patent law in the 18th century. The role of the judges in the late 18th and early 19th century English courts was vital in the development of patent law. As there was usually no examination of a patent claim before registration, that meant the first real test of the validity of a patent was by the judges if a patentee sued for the infringement of his invention. But by the mid-18th century, patent disputes in the common law courts had been few and far between. There was hardly any patent law to guide the judges. As far as legislation was concerned, all they had was the old Statute of Monopolies from 1624, which had one section on patents for new inventions, and for the rest a few old cases. This left the development of patent law very largely in the hands of the judges. Now, the Statute of Monopolies, uh, as its name suggests, was primarily concerned with monopolies. Patents for new inventions formed one of the exceptions to that general prohibition on monopolies. The first and true inventor could be awarded a patent as long as the invention was for a new manufacturer and one of the provisions was not generally inconvenient. So to be patentable, an invention had to be a manufacturer. But what was the meaning of the term manufacturer in the Statute of Monopolies? And it was that issue which would bring a lot of diverse judicial opinion to the fore. Now, back in the 18th century, the word manufacturer was still being used to describe a whole industry. So they would talk of the woolen manufacturer and uh, the linen manufacturer. And it is possible that this was the meaning that the drafters of the Statute of Monopolies had in mind when they had used the term manufacture back in 1623, at a time when the importation of whole new industries was seen to be very important. But given the lack of precedent on how the term manufacture should be interpreted, in the cases heard in the latter part of the 18th century, the meaning given to the term would depend to a certain extent upon an individual judge's interpretational style. That style could be predominantly formalistic, a literal black letter uh, of the law approach. Or it could be predominantly teleological, purposive approach, interpreting the law within a contemporary uh, social context. A judge using a literal approach to the word manufacture would see manufacture in terms of something made by the hands of man, its etymology being manus and factura. This required a thing to have been made. On the other hand, a judge adopting a purposive, teleological approach was more likely to recognise that many patents had been granted for methods already that these methods were of great value to industry and therefore to the country and should therefore be equally deserving of protection as was a material thing. 
Now, whether there could be patent protection for a process as separate from a product uh, was considered in great detail in the case of Bolton and Watt and Bull in 1795. Now, that was one of the cases dealing with the, uh, James Watt's patent for the steam engine. The defendant in that case had been accused of infringing Watt's patent, but it had been argued for the defendant that Watt's patent was not for a mechanical device, but rather for a method. Indeed, Watt had himself described his invention in the patent specification as a method of lessening the consumption of steam and consequently fuel in fire engines. But said the defendant, a method was not a manufacture and therefore could not be patented and therefore there was no infringement of Watt's patent because Watt's patent was simply not valid. In Bolton and Watt, the majority of the judges expressed the opinion that a process could not be the subject matter of a patent. One of the judges, Justice Buller, argued, I think it is impossible to support a patent for a method only without having carried it into effect and produced some new substance. When the thing is done or produced, then it becomes the manufacture, which is the proper subject of a patent. So, according to that reading, a manufacturer required a new physical article to be produced. There could be no patent for a process as separate from a product. And of like mind was, for example, Justice Heath. He considered that the term manufacturer covered two classes. The first class was machinery, and the second class was substances produced by chemical or other processes. However, the subject matter of a patent must be something that could be bought and sold. It had to be a manufacture, something tangible, uh, a machine or a substance, but something that could be bought and sold. The grant of a method, he said, is not good. Lord Chief Justice Eyre, however, had a very different opinion on this matter in Bolton and Watt and Ball. He emphasised that methods could be of great value to the development of industry and trade, and saw no reason to exclude them from patentability. Given that the patent system at that time was one of registration rather than examination, many patents for method had already been granted. Eyre saw no reason, in his words, to shake the foundation upon which these patents stand. Probably I do not overrate it when I state that two-thirds, I believe I might say three-fourths, of all patents granted since the statute passed are for methods of operating and of manufacturing, producing no new substances and employing no new machinery. Eyre was aware of patents for new methods where the sole method, sorry, the sole merit and the only effect produced was the saving of time and expense, which lowered the price of the article and therefore introduced it into more general use. Eyre said, Now I think these methods may be said to be new manufacturers in one of the common acceptations of the word, as we speak of manufacturing of glass or anything of that kind. So, as Chief Justice Eyre had considered the term manufacture did encompass a method, but the other judges had not, it was still not entirely clear uh, whether a method was patentable or not. A judge using a literal approach to the word manufacture would see manufacture in terms of a thing made by the hands of man, so he needed a thing. And that was indeed seen as the meaning of the term manufacture by Lord Kenyon in Hornblower and Bolton and Watt, another case on Watt's steam engine, which was heard a few years later in 1799. But Eyre was not the only judge who thought the term manufacture could cover a method as well as a physical thing. Uh, Lord Eldon, Chancellor of the Court of Chancery, was of the same opinion. However, more commonly, judges sidestepped the issue by holding a process patent to be valid if it included a material component. So any instruments that have been built to put the process into effect will be seen as the manufacture 
although those instruments were only relevant to carrying out the process itself. Legal uncertainty on the patentability of methods persisted into the 19th century. However, Collier, who wrote the first ever legal treatise on patent law in 1803, asserted, a patent cannot be granted for a method or principle. Its object must be some substantial thing produced. Although Collier did go on to note that if the patentee described his invention as a method, when in fact the patent spe specification showed it was a tangible thing, the verbal inaccuracy would not invalidate the patent. Richard Godson, writing his legal treatise on patents some 20 years later than Collier, and a rather more sophisticated work than Collier's, was less emphatic with respect to the status of a method. That a mere method of making a thing or a process or a manner of operating cannot be the subject of a patent is not quite so clear. Much discussion has taken place on this rule. Now, while Godson, like Collier, was convinced that the simple use of the term method would not itself invalidate a patent if the specification was actually describing something tangible, he doubted that a method in itself was sufficient for a patent. A process cannot be a manufacture within the meaning of the statute because it is destitute of one of the qualities absolutely necessary to be found in a new manufacture or subject proper for a patent, materiality. The description given by that very learned judge, ARCJ, is not of anything that can be made. There is nothing corporal, nothing tangible, nothing that can be bought or sold. No instrument by which the supposed benefit is produced and which might, as an article of trade, be purchased and used by another person. The legal uncertainty concerning the validity of process patents was one of the reasons that a uh, select uh, committee on patents for new inventions was constituted in 1829. Benjamin Roch appeared as a witness before that select committee. Uh, Roch was a barrister well known for his scientific knowledge. Uh, he'd appeared as counsel in several patent cases uh, and was himself a patentee. Roch argued that the main source of the problems confronting patent law was the statute of monopolies itself. The words of the statute, which are extremely well calculated for those times, do not happen now at all to hit the necessities of the present period. The consequence is that the judges are constantly straining the meaning of this act to make it meet the necessity of the times. Thus, it depends on the extent of laxity that a judge will venture to give as to what the law at this particular day in any particular court happens to be on patents. As Roch intimated, there had been court decisions which had already de facto sanctioned a reading of the term manufacture that was broader than a literal interpretation of that term. And here are a few of them. In the 1820s and 30s, various cases established that there could be a patent for processes involving a new combination of well-known materials. Examples are Hall's patent for singeing off superfluous fibres of lace, Russell's patent for welding tubes, Derosny's patent for taking the colour out of sugar, and Cornish's patent for elastic cloth. A change in a process which enabled a product to be made more efficiently or more economically had been implicitly accepted by these judges as constituting the manufacture. That a method could be the subject matter of a patent was endorsed by Lord Chief Justice Tyndall in Crane and Price, 1842, and this case has been seen as finally settling the law on this point. A shift in judicial interpretation had taken place. A manufacture could be a process as well as a tangible object. So, 
In the 18th, early 19th century, the legal point at issue was whether a process as separate from a product could be the subject matter of a patent. By the mid 19th century, a process was not by very definition excluded from patentability. But even in modern times, not all processes are patentable. Article 52.2 two of the European Patent Convention 1973 explicitly excluded certain inventions from patentability. Inventive processes excluded from patentability included a mathematical method, a business method, and a program for a computer as such. Now, a computer program can be seen as a process, as it is the computer program that instructs and directs the hardware. The patent legislation of European states, like the United Kingdom but also the Netherlands, uh, was modelled upon the EPC, and these exclusions were therefore incorporated into national patent statutes. Yet the legal debate on the patent eligibility of computer programmes would prove to be far from over. The approach to the, to the protection of a computer programme adopted in Europe would be to consider it as a literary work and hence protected by copyright. But programmers often found copyright protection insufficient. Yes, it would prevent someone else from copying the original expression of the source code and the object's code, code. but it was often possible for a programmer to work around the copyright protection. A programmer could implement a program's functionality in different ways, avoiding copyright. And indeed, the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union has just ruled that only the expression of the source code and the object code are protected by copyright, not the functionality of a computer program, nor the programming language. In the case of software-related inventions, a patent, on the other hand, would give an exclusive right to apply the idea. So, it's not very surprising that uh, cases involving software-related inventions made their way into court. While it was acknowledged that a computer program could not be patented, the prohibition in the EPC and uh, the UK Patents Act 1977 only applied to a computer program as such. The issue then, confronting the English judges, like their colleagues in Europe, was to determine when a computer program was only a computer program and therefore excluded from patentability, or when a computer program was something more than just a computer program as such and not excluded from patentability. In the courtroom discussions on the meaning of the term computer program, we see a familiar scenario, a diversity of judicial interpretation. For example, Justice Falconer's interpretation of a computer program in the case of Merrill Lynch's application was later disputed by the Court of Appeal in the Genotech case. In Gale's application, the Court of Appeal reached a different conclusion than had been reached by Justice Aldous in the Patents Court hearing of that case. By the time the Court of Appeal heard Aerotel and Tulka Holdings in 2006, the Court was able to observe that different approaches had been adopted over the years. Two different approaches were the so-called technical character approach and the any hardware approach. The technical character approach asks whether the invention has a technical effect, whether it makes a technical contribution to the prior art. If not, it is excluded. But a technical contribution would make a computer program more than a computer program per se. This was the approach adopted in Gale and Fujitsu, and the approach of the English courts was similar to that adopted by the EPO Board of Appeal in Vicom. The other approach, the any hardware approach, asks whether it incorporates or is implemented by some technical means such as a computer. If the claim involves the use of or is to a piece of hardware, then the exclusion would not apply. This approach had been taken by the Boards of Appeal in a trio of cases, pension benefits, Hitachi and Microsoft data transfer cases, although within this trio there were variations 
out of the any hardware approach. In the Airtel case, Lord Justice Jacob was critical of the state of conflict which had emerged between the Boards of Appeal old approach applied in the Vicom decision and its new approach in cases like Hitachi. Jacob considered that this change in course by the Board was based upon an incorrect interpretation of what the EPC had meant by the term computer program. He explained that one interpretation saw a computer program as a set of instructions which could be written down on a piece of paper, an abstract thing. Another interpretation of computer program was that the term also covered the instructions on some form of media, such as a disk or hard drive, which caused the computer to execute the program. In other words, a program in a working form. The earlier Board of Appeal decisions and the decisions of the English Court of Appeal indicated that simply incorporating a computer program in a piece of hardware was not in itself sufficient to prevent the exclusion. A further technical contribution was needed. The trio of decisions reached by the board in more recent cases indicated that a program on a physical carrier was not a computer program as such because then the computer program was more than an abstract set of instructions. Jacob, expressing the view of the Court of Appeal, considered that the board's new reading of the term computer program was wrong. The exclusion in the EPC was meant to cover not just an abstract series of instructions, but also a working program, otherwise the exclusion was without real content. The Court of Appeal, uh, in the Airtel uh, case, rejected the any hardware will do interpretation. The patentability status of software related inventions had become increasingly confused. That confusion was acknowledged in the Astron Clinica case heard in the Patents Court in 2008. Justice Kitchen reviewed this history of conflicting in interpretations. He pointed out that the criticism of the English Court of Appeal in the Airtel case with respect to recent decisions by the boards of the EPO quote, is directed at the any hardware will do approach and the return to form over substance with a drawing of a distinction between a program as a set of instructions and a program on a carrier. In short, he said, the board appears to have found that any program on a carrier has a technical character and so escapes the prohibition in Article 52 following Hitachi. But he also made a particularly interesting remark. He considered that the board was clearly influenced by the apparent illogicality of allowing claims to a suitably programmed computer and to the method performed by the computer, so programmed, but not to the program itself. Up to the present day, there is still no one, one standard interpretation of Article 52 EPC. Comparing the process disputes in the Industrial Revolution and the disputes on the patentability of computer programs, several observations can be made. Each statute brings to the fore its own interpretational difficulties for judges. English judges in the 18th century had to develop the legal concept of what constituted a manufacture in the Statute of Monopolies 1624. English judges in the 20th century had to develop the legal concept of what was meant by a computer program as such in Article 52 to EPC which formed the basis for Section 1, Subsection 2 of the Patents Act 1977. The law relating to the patenting of new inventions was in its infancy in the 18th century. With little in the way of developed law to guide them, it was left to the judges to try to determine whether methods were a manufacture and hence patentable. The dominant interpretation in the 18th century 
that a physical object was required to constitute a manufacture would give way by the early 19th century, as the courts de facto accepted, a process could be patentable. So too, in the early years following the implementation of the Patents Act 1977, there was no well-established body of case law to help judges determine the nature of a computer program. Judges would disagree upon when a computer program was a computer program as such, as judges applied different approaches. In 1829, Roch had considered that the statute of monopolies, a product of the 17th century, was no longer in tune with the needs of society. He considered that the legal uncertainty had arisen because judges were straining the meaning of the act to make it meet the necessities of the times. The same thing could be argued with respect to the Patents Act. What had the drafters of the EPC back in the early 1970s understood a computer program as such to be? No definition was given in the EPC, as it was left to the boards of appeal and national courts to work out the detail. But the 1970s was an age when computer hardware filled a whole floor and no one had a PC back when software was seldom sold, but was usually included on large computers, or the user simply made his own program. Back before Bill Gates' Microsoft had brought the digital revolution to ordinary members of the public. Did the courts and the boards, back in the 70s and 80s, really understand the new digital technology, or appreciate the important role that software would play in a new digital world? Is the older interpretation of a computer program as such from that time no longer in tune with the needs of contemporary society? If the boards of the EPO in more recent times came to the conclusion that to exclude the program itself was illogical, this illogicality has arguably resulted in the EPO's any hardware will do approach. I would argue that this any hardware will do approach has its parallel in the approach to process patents by English courts in the 18th, early 19th century. At that time, the underlying question was whether it was illogical to exclude from patentability a method that was clearly of great value to commerce and industry, simply because the term manufacture was being generally interpreted as referring to a material product. In determining whether a method fell within the scope of the term manufacture, the approach that would be adopted by the English courts by the early 19th century could be termed the any instrument will do approach. During the early phase of the Industrial Revolution, only a few judges were prepared openly to treat the term manufacture as covering a method separate from a product. Nonetheless, by accepting any instrument produced that was necessary for the method to be carried out as being the manufacture, a patent for a process could be upheld. Pinning the patentability of a computer program to some form of material object, hardware, is very reminiscent of the reasoning of the majority of the late 18th, early 19th century judges in these process cases. Over the course of the Industrial Revolution, the teleological purposive approach would triumph over a more formalistic approach to the interpretation of the term manufacture. As Lord Mansfield stated, as the usages of society alter, the law must adapt itself to the various situations of mankind. Methods of use and value to industry would be accepted as patentable. Similarly, with respect to the interpretation of a computer program as such, a teleological purposive approach will probably triumph over a more formalistic, restrictive approach. Software has become a valuable item, and sometimes that software costs more than the hardware on which it is running. Commentators observe that hardware is becoming of less value than it was to the market back in the period in which the EPC was drafted. 
and indeed one commentator has predicted, the time will come when manufacturers will give away computers so as to be able to sell software. To conclude, English judges in the 18th, early 19th century rejected an earlier interpretation of the term manufacture in the light of a new industrial social context. It is highly likely that the judges of the 21st century will adjust the legal concept of a computer program as such to fit the social context of the digital age. Copyright protection only extends to the original expression of the source code and object code. That means the way the program functions, the way it works, is unprotected unless it can be protected by patent. Arguably, a computer program as such may then come to mean nothing more than what is covered by copyright protection. If so, the exclusion of a computer program as such from patentability may indeed, in practice, become meaningless. Thank you for your time.